Good morning. I am Marshall Davis. It's a beautiful day here in central New Hampshire on May 19th. It's sunny and the sun is out and uh, two of my grandchildren are going to be coming over later on this morning. And I've not seen them hardly at all during this whole uh, pandemic. So we're going to be uh, outside and uh, keeping our social distance. So I'm looking forward to that. But before that, I thought I would uh, record this episode, which is going to be the first of what I hope is several of the non-dual teachings of Jesus. Jesus was a teacher of what he called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And I call it the presence of God, unitive awareness or Christian non-duality. And the primary way that he communicated this reality was in stories, which are called parables. Today I'm going to look at two of his stories which are grouped together in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, under the heading of Lost and Found. Now actually there are three stories in that chapter, and I was originally planned to talk on all three, but I realized that was too much to take on. So I'm going to postpone talking about the famous story of the, the Lost Son, also called the Prodigal Son, and focus on the other two stories which are the stories of the lost sheep and the lost coin. All of them are about people who have lost something and searched for it and found it. From most pulpits, these are interpreted in a simple manner. Preachers say that they are about us being lost and subsequently saved by God. And to receive that salvation, we have to repent of our sins. Segue to John 3.16 and cue the singing of Amazing Grace. But that is not what it means. There is much more going on in these stories than this. These are not morality tales. Jesus was not Aesop and parables are not fables. Jesus is revealing secrets of the kingdom of God. That is what Jesus said he was doing in the parables. When Jesus, when the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied this way. He said, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. I think these stories are about men and women looking for the kingdom of God. So let's look at them in this way for a moment. When we do this, it immediately raises the question of whether the kingdom can be found by searching for it, and also whether it can be lost. In one sense, there is nothing that we can do to lose or to find the kingdom of God. How can you lose what's all around you? I mean, Christians call God omnipresent. That means present everywhere at all times. How can you lose something or find something that is present everywhere at all times? So it is not a matter of losing and finding as much as it is a matter of recognizing what is already present. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you and in your midst, all around you. He said the kingdom of God is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. What can you do to find something that is already here? It's like a fish looking for water or a bird looking for air. As the Apostle Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus told the story of a woman who lost a silver coin somewhere in her house. It was very important to her. It was likely part of a string of coins that were embroidered onto her wedding dress or in a, in a, in a necklace and was given to her as a gift by her husband on a wedding day. Coins were often used as jewelry, and they still are in many parts of the Middle East today. And this would have been her money 
not her husband's money. So she got to use this any way that she needed to, especially if she got in a bind. This gave her a certain amount of financial security in a society where women did not have much financial security. And these coins also would have been of great sentimental value as a wedding gift. And they were a status symbol also in the community as well. Well, somehow, one of them got lost, fell off. She lost it and she turned the house upside down looking for the coin. It says she, she used a small oil lamp uh, to search all the corners of her dark house. And she was sweeping the floor. That would have been a dirt floor, so it would not have been an easy job. She kept looking till she found it. And then when she found it, she celebrated with her friends. And then, he says that Jesus adds these words to the story. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, those words are the key to interpreting or misinterpreting this parable. They are exactly the reason most Christians misinterpret the parable today. For you see, most biblical scholars, at least those who are not tied to the inerrancy of Scripture and acknowledge that a text has a history of literary development, most of the scholars believe that Jesus never said those words, that these words were added later by the writer or the editors of the gospel. Now, why do scholars believe this? From the content, the non sequitur. This verse obviously doesn't belong. It refers to sinners and repenting. But the story has nothing to do with sin or repentance. Where are the sinners and the repenting in the story? Was the woman a sinner? Did the woman repent? Was the coin a sin sinner? Did the coin repent? You see how silly this is? The verse doesn't fit and makes no sense in the context of the story. It's obvious that it was added later. What happened is that the early church interpreted this story in the light of their theology of salvation, which developed in the decades after Jesus died and before the Gospels were written down, which is the whole generation after the cross, after everyone who knew Jesus died. The church interpreted the story to refer to us, being spiritually lost and having to be spiritually found. In their theology, that meant repentance. And repentance sure wasn't in the story so they had to add it to the end of the story and put it into Jesus' mouth. The same with the story of the lost sheep. Jesus told the story of a man <clears throat> who had a flock of a hundred sheep, and one day one was missing. So he left the ninety-nine and went in search of the lost sheep until he found it. He brought it back on his shoulders and he celebrated with his friends and neighbors. And that's the story, but then... Then it says that Jesus added these words, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now the reference to the 99 makes it clear that it refers to the sheep. But was that one sheep a sinful sheep? Did that sheep repent? Can sheep repent? Obviously not. The story obviously has nothing to do with sinners repenting or being found by God or by the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. The concept of Jesus as the Good Shepherd came later. It first appears only in the Gospel of John, which was written around 100 AD or so, which is about 70 years after Jesus. Jesus was not a shepherd. He was a carpenter. This story is not about sinners repenting. It's about men and women looking for and finding something of great value. And I think 
it refers to the kingdom of God. Since all of Jesus' parables were about the kingdom of God, and most of the time Jesus explicitly states that at the very beginning. An important element that points to this is the focus on the value of what the people were looking for. The woman valued the coin greatly, and the shepherd valued the sheep. In fact, in the Gospel of Thomas, the one lost sheep is said to be larger than the other 99 sheep. Jesus va valued the kingdom of God above all else, which is very clear in his parables. Spiritual seekers value the kingdom of God by whatever name their spiritual tradition calls it. Seekers place high value on liberation awakening, enlightenment, salvation, however you picture it. Some people yearn for it and search for it, going to spiritual teachers and religious leaders in search of it. They are willing to sacrifice a lot and put in all sorts of time and effort to find the answer to the ultimate question of life. That is what traditional organized religion, as well as unorganized contemporary spirituality, are all about. There are a lot of seekers doing a lot of spiritual practices, hoping they will find what they are looking for. That's the motif of the hero's journey in the sacred tales of the cultures of the world. Mythologist Joseph Campbell made that clear in his book the hero with a thousand faces. There are ordeals that we go through in our spiritual search and they turn into stories that we tell about our lives. We see them in the stories about the lives of the founders of the world's religions, whether that be Buddha or Christ or Muhammad. Yet in the end, it is really a matter of grace. And that's the point of the coin being found. The coin did nothing to be found. The sheep did nothing to be found. That's also true of people. Even the founders of the great religions, whether it be the Holy Spirit anointing Jesus at his baptism in the Jordan River or the Buddha, suddenly awaking under the Bodhi tree or Mohammed receiving the Quran in the cave of Mount Hera. It was all grace. In the end, it's not about a seeker, nor is it about a spiritual destination. Both the idea of a destination and a seeker fall away when the kingdom of God is seen. The seeker falls away and is no more. Jesus becomes the Christ. Gautama becomes the Buddha, Muhammad becomes the prophet, the searching stops and the kingdom appears. In these parables there is reunion, literally coming together again of what had been separate, two become one, duality become unity, lost is found, the emotions of anxiety and worry that accompany the searching transition into the joy of finding. This is the non-dual message of the Kingdom of God. That is it for today. Grace and peace to you.